and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 159. Your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. And me, Ravi Abbott. I like it when we're recording the evenings, because this week we're doing this at like 8 o'clock at night. And I've actually been quite excited to come in and do this week's show. Yeah, we've been doing lots of mornings with the Australian ones recently, <laughs> haven't we? So and the fact that I've, I've been at home wallpapering all day as oh, well, which um, yeah. actually gets me out of doing that for an hour or two, which is quite nice. And you've been messing around with mini disc players. I've been messing <laughs> around with mini disc players indeed. After last week, I purchased a, a kind of mini disc separate unit and then somebody messaged me instantly on Discord and said, oh, I've got a spare mini disc player. I was like, oh, God. So <laughs> now I've got another one arriving, so I've got to try and get rid of that if anybody wants a mini disc player contact me <laughs> Ravi's got them coming out of his ears yeah. I mean I love it when stuff like that happens because we did do like a chat about mini disc last week and then you jumped straight out on eBay and bought one oh, totally. I often do that when we're chatting about subjects on the show I'm like let's have a look on Amazon then I got all these surprise parcels turn up in the week and I'm like I don't remember ordering that. I'm like, ah, oh, yeah. I did need to stand for my PlayStation 2. Well, well I've uh, got uh, it set up at the moment, recording tracks at home. But today, I mean, interestingly, talking about minidisc, if you thought that was an obscure format in 2019, I've got to tell you about this techno DJ from Germany who's released a new album on possibly the coolest and uh, today quite an obscure platform that not many people are bringing out albums for. Could be a bit of a first, actually. Because today is actually quite an audio episode, isn't it? We're going to be talking a lot about music today. Oh, totally. We've got Frank Hablaki on, and he's like one of the best video game composers in history. I just love his stuff. When I was a kid, his stuff totally changed, and it changed gaming at the time that the technology was changing. Mm. So the sound card was coming in, your sound blaster, you had your CD-ROM, you know, you could actually get like hardcore bass lines on there and Frank was a fan of Nine Inch Nails yeah. all the metal stuff so he was the main co- video game composer for Westwood so he did the Dune 2 soundtrack and then Blade Runner yeah he did Blade Runner and then of course Command and Conquer which yeah. was just absolutely amazing and to the point that he did Red Alert he did Red Alert 2 Red Alert 3 and now he's doing the Command and Conquer remake soundtrack we need to ask him about that oh yes and he did live performances if you've not seen this this is the coolest thing ever he did Command and Conquer live and he had this like Prince style guitar that he's got which is just beautiful and he had this big you know Nod who were the enemy forces in Command and Conquer yeah, he yeah. had this huge robe on and uh, like an orchestra behind him <laughs> <laughs> just rock it out <laughs> rock it out and, and he created the Hell March which is one of the most famous soundtracks it's actually become a meme now have you seen the, yeah, uh, yeah. the Pikachus marching to the Hell March well, it's icon- <laughs> one of the most iconic video game soundtracks ever isn't it oh totally um, and, he, and the, the cool thing about him is he's so versatile too he's not all Nine Inch Nails he did Disney's Lion King soundtrack as well oh yeah of course and also some Star Wars stuff because he's he's a massive um star wars fan yeah. so yeah he's done some good games with them and mtv adverts and mtv so adverts so much it's going to be a great interview this one yeah frank Koplaki is our guest he's coming up on the retro hour podcast in around 15 minutes from now now we've got some good news to talk about this week as well um i mentioned the playstation 2 my little stand that i bought for it this week i did get one of those actually you know the little kind of like really light blue little stands that oh yeah yeah i saw one of those in the picture and thought, i haven't got a stand for mine so i bought one of ebay uh, but i'm actually set my ps2 up again recently which is good timing because there has been a port of something really cool to the PlayStation 2 that we'll chat about in a minute. And also, we're going to have a little think about what retro gaming will be like in 20 years from now. Something to start thinking about there, Ravi. Oh, couldn't you still have Cracktros? Yeah, Yeah. bring back Cracktros. Before we do all that, though, let's give a big shout to our favourite people ever, the people who allow us to come in here and talk to you about stuff like mini-discs and PlayStation 2s and future of retro gaming and that is people who make a donation into the running of the retro hour podcast just like this week making the hall of fame Stephen and Gillian murphy lucas poor hashimi michael stoofs and jarno milikinen who all made donations into the running of the show and if you'd like to do the same honestly every penny every cent every euro every dollar that we get goes 100 percent back into the running of the show and let's just keep doing this podcast week in, week out. We accept PayPal, a um, few ways you can donate. You'll find all of that in the support section of the retrohour.com and it is massively appreciated. And you will get a mention on a future episode of the show. All right, let's talk about the PlayStation 2. Do you use RetroArch? I use RetroArch all the time and I use a thing called Beetlejuice, which is basically the PS2 uh, on RetroArch on the PC. Right. 
and it has so many cool little functions like you can basically add in anti-aliasing you can add in all these extra effects so your ps2 games can actually look better yeah. than they do on the ps2 using all your fancy pc graphics card stuff i think that's awesome when you see that as well because i mean you think of those kind of old 3d games because they're all polygon based i guess all they have to do is like improve the maths a bit and put more polygons in and make them higher yeah and... and there's this thing called um steam rom manager so if you download steam rom manager it scans all your roms yeah it connects to retroarch and then it creates launches for them in steam so you can actually just launch a game straight through Steam and it even skips the PlayStation logo and you can just go straight into the game. Oh, I like the PlayStation logo. Yeah, same here. <laughs> I'll leave it on. Well, the reason we're talking about this is, I mean, if you don't use RetroArch, it's essentially a front end for emulators, isn't it? Um, yeah, and it supports a lot of emulators. Like, um, it's all the cores yeah. are basically on there. I mean, you can get individual cores and then uh, kind of change the specification and launch them using little shortcuts on the launchers and stuff. Even little icons and stuff, so yeah. they look really nice. Well, it has been ported to the PlayStation 2, which I thought was really cool. Now, if you've got a modded PlayStation 2, um, now the PS2 is, like, ridiculously easy to mod these days, isn't it? You can soft mod them, you know, for next to nothing. Um, and this guy, um, his name is um, FJ Trudley. Um, he started porting this to the PlayStation 2 as of version 1.7.6, you can already try RetroArch on your own homebrew-enabled PS2. Now, it's obviously an early release on the PlayStation mm-hmm. 2, but already there's a few things he's put in there. Um, you've got a NES emulator, two different ones, Quick NES, and one called FCEUMM. And there's one called Epico Drive as well, which is the Mega Drive slash Genesis emulator as well. And apparently he's run at a pretty good speed. Now, he's recommended a few little optimizations you can do, because obviously it's early days of this port. Yeah, you kind of have to do certain tweaks for the PlayStation, I guess. And yeah, the, v- the been... V-Sync's got to be on, for example, on QuickNES yeah. to get good performance and everything. But uh, it also means that you can um, you know, kind of load up all your ROMs and stuff on here too, because the PlayStation 2's got a hard disk in it. Ah, yes. They're, they're saying on this one you actually run it off the USB. Yeah. But I can imagine in the later version... There was that hard disk slot at the back, wasn't there? On the fat. Yeah, so you could probably fill it up with all your games and then just launch them off there in the future. Because the bad thing about the PlayStation 2 was the USB slot, I think, was USB 1.1. Ah, right, so okay. not the yeah. quickest in the world. <laughs> yeah. So having a hard disk solution would be a lot more useful, I think. But again, I mean, it is a first ever port of this year. The fact that he's got it up and running and the, the legwork's been done to get it running on the PlayStation. Because running emulation on the original Xbox, it's a brilliant platform to run, like, you know, all the classic games on. I've got a modded Xbox with, like, a 500 gigabyte hard disk in with loads of MAME titles on there, Super Nintendo, Mega Drive, everything on there. So I think more people have PlayStation 2s. Gathering does probably the next boxes in their cupboard. Yeah, you can basically push that to um, some crazy limits, can't you? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've even got, like, Nintendo 64 stuff running on the, the original Xbox, which it coaches with some games all right, but not others. Um, and did it do 720p as yeah, well? Can do yeah, it can do 720p. Yeah. But I mean, you can even get 720p out of the PlayStation 2 if you've got component cables. So the thing about it is, I mean, I, I love the fact that they're kind of repurposing this old hardware and giving it kind of a new lease of life because... Like I said, a lot of these machines, you pick them up for next to nothing. I mean, how much is a PlayStation 2 now? Like, what, 15 quid? Yeah, if you go to cash converters and yeah. see one, and then you can use that as your, like, solution for lots of machines and have all your other ones pristine on the shelf. Well, there's this good um, website here called LibRetro, and they're talking, actually, there's been um, a couple of other retro arch ports have done a PlayStation 4 port of it as well. It's okay. in the works at the moment. You need to have a jailbroken PS4, obviously. And Xbox One port's just been released as well, if you've got a modded Xbox One. And they've even ported this, I thought was really cool, to the Apple TV. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because the Apple TV have famously been jailbroken. And <laughs> well, apparently you can run this time. on non-jailbroken oh, Apple wow. TVs. They've got right. a, they found a way of doing it. So I've got an Apple TV in the bedroom. <laughs> we've, got like, we've got a TV bed. Oh, God. Have What's you ever this? seen these? No, no, I'm not. Well... I had to convince the missus to buy this last year when we moved. So it's a bed, looks like a normal bed, and it's got like this kind of like cover at the end of the bed, and you've got a little remote control. You press it, and then a TV rises out the end of the bed. I'm going to come and kick your wife out. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you want to get in bed with me, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. That, that's not Play weird. some retro arch. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get talked about that. <laughs> but it's, um, it is really cool to like watch TV and stuff in bed. But I was saying the other day to her, you know, I wasn't feeling too well one day last week and I went to bed in the afternoon I thought, I said, I might bring my Xbox in here and plug it in. She goes, no, you're bloody not. That's, <laughs> that's how it starts. That's so. the decline, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I think maybe I'll have to uh, get RetroArch installed on that. Yeah, it's amazing because 
you think of all the titles that came out for the PS2, and there yeah. were so many good ones. Like Burnout, I've been playing that one. That Burnout Takedown and, you know, Simpsons Hit and Run and stuff. Yeah. There were some great games. Well, I was thinking the other day, it's the reason I've got my, you know, I've got this little stand for the PS2. I've got it set up again in my home office. You know, I've only lived there about four months. I'm already starting to fill my space in my room, as oh, you'd imagine. Um, but I've got it set up on my desk now, so I wanted to stand for it. And I thought, it, you know, it would be really cool to play some of those games again. Because I haven't given my PS2 much love for a, a few years now. Yeah, really. yeah, it was a really good console. Now, another one I might need to set up again that's um, currently in my cupboard. Shock horror, and it's one of my favourite systems ever. The Sega Mega Drive. Now, can you believe this? There's going to be an album released by a German techno DJ on a Mega Drive cartridge. Yeah, so this guy, Remute, he's been around the scene for quite a long time and he's actually done a lot of floppy disk releases before. I was talking to him last year on Facebook. Cool. And this is awesome because it looks like he's now somehow managed to release a tune on a Mega Drive cart, which is just insane. Well, this is called Techno-Optimistic or Techno-Optimistic LP. And yeah, he's releasing the full album on an actual Mega Drive cartridge that you can plug into your original machine. He calls it the first plug-and-play techno album. So you put it in, and the way it works is it's not recorded music on the cartridge. Okay. It's actually programmed with software that directly addresses the Yamaha sound chip in the Mega Drive console itself. That's To smart. generate the music. Yeah, so, I mean, it's not very big, you know. It's only um, four megabytes, I think. There's a flash uh, RAM chip in here. Do you want to hear a little bit of it? Yeah, I know his music's proper banging, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. That is instantly recognisable as Mega Drive, don't it? Oh, yeah, it's got that rolling kind of, yeah. It's quite chill techno, actually. It's quite nice. Now, this is out now, and I'll put a link in our show notes as well. Now, obviously, the main thing about this is he recommends that you listen to it on a Mega Drive Model 1. Ah. Because remember, that had the stereo output, didn't it, from the headphone jack? The Model 2 will work, and even if you've got one of the clones or anything, probably don't try it on that games console. I think there'll be like a, a 32X remix. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but, I mean, you know, the thing about it is because there's different variants of the Mega Drive, they all kind of generate audio a little bit differently, so he's designed it for a, a Model 1, which is my yeah. favourite model of the Mega Drive anyway. But I think that's really awesome that he's doing that actual full album by a professional musician released on a Mega Drive. And I, and I guess if he uses that, because that's a Yamaha chip, yeah. He could do that on the Game Boy as well, on a few other things as well that used it. Didn't that, this, the Atari ST had a Yamaha chip in there, I think. I think so. One of the yeah, Spectrums, I, I don't know if it's the same one, but... No, uh, it's not, no, but yeah. There and, might be some commands that kind of hit the same bits, you know. Yeah, you want to blast it out on your Game Boy on the bus, don't you? Yeah. You're one of them kids at the back of the bus. <laughs> oh, yeah, I used to have this program called Nano Loops, which yeah. was like a little tracker for Game Boy, and you could just sit there like... Doo, 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 <laughs> and people would just stare at you. Everyone tutting on the bus. Yeah. <laughs> Now, let's talk about GameStop. I mean, it's uh, a brand that we haven't got here in the UK, but we did actually go to the one in Athlone, didn't we, when we were over there the other week? In, yeah, in, and in I went over to the ones in America as well yep. and saw them, and uh, the ones in America were a lot of people in the queue queuing up for the PlayStation ca- Classic going, why haven't I got a power adapter in here? And then GameStop going, well, you can buy our power adapters. Yeah, for a reasonable $20. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but GameStop, I mean, it's a very popular brand around the world. Um, whenever I'm abroad in like place like Italy, for example, or Spain, we often try, you know, I convince the missus to pop in for five minutes, just have a look, and then pick up a load of games and realise, actually, these are all in Italian, I'm not going to play them at yeah. home. But they have been going through the best time over the last couple of years. And it, it kind of does mirror the situation that we've had here in the UK. I mean, we've had, like, um, Game, which is our big game shop on the high street. So they're not connected at all? No, they're not. Yeah, different companies. But here in the UK, we had Game who bought out Game Station that was another brand. I really love Game Station here in the UK. Game went through a lot of trouble, went into administration, got rescued. It was about two years ago now, Mm. wasn't it? They're closing a lot of them down, though, even in our city. I mean, one of the one, the main one on the market square, Nottingham, went a few months ago, didn't it? Yeah. Um, but GameStop had the same issue. Now, last year, they kind of, you know, admitted they were in big financial trouble. And they've been looking for an acquisition. So they've been in talks with a few companies to invest money in them. Um, and it looked like it was going to happen at the back end of last year. But they had a real big problem earlier on in the year when they got a CEO, Michael Mauler, his name was, who stayed at the company only three months before he quit. Oh, gosh. Which is, um, doesn't inspire confidence in any board, does it? Let's be honest. But it turns out, after having those two main companies they were talking to, um, who went in, did a big look at the company, explored all of its assets and future business plans, and essentially decided to pull out and said, look, we don't think it's a viable business. So they released this press release, essentially says, look, we haven't got a buyer. 
it's not looking good for them. Because I remember the main thing that I was seeing about GameStop was a few years ago they'd started refurbishing consoles. Yeah. And they'd started reselling like older games and older consoles and Dreamcasts and stuff like that. So I thought maybe, oh, they might be riding the retro wave a little bit, but um, that's not good uh, <laughs> good prediction so far, is it? Yeah, well, they've got 7,000 shops, I think, in total. So, you know, it's... Uh, yeah, it's yeah and if that's a worldwide brand as well. Yeah. yeah, I mean, apparently after, you know, the announcement, their stock has hit a 14-year low this week. So, well, it kind of leads to a more, I guess, a wider-reaching conversation. I mean, I was watching a video by... Um, there's a, a guy on YouTube called Review Tech USA who covers mm-hmm. a lot of news and stuff, one of my favourite channels. And he was talking about this, and he's got kids, and he said, you know, it kind of makes him a bit sad that his kids are never going to experience going to Toys R Us, for example. I I don't think that's the case, to be honest. I think they are going to happen, but I think at the moment it's it's all about getting the profit, and they're not really aiming in the right direction, and they haven't got the community aspect. Like, one thing that I saw was, I know this is modern tech, sorry about that, but one thing I saw was when I was in... America was I went to the Apple store. Yeah. The Apple store was very much sell, sell, buy, buy, sell. I went to the Windows store and in the Windows stores the guys came up to me and asked, like, Oh, what job are you doing? What and they were recommending free software. Which I was like, wait, these guys aren't doing the hard stuff. Microsoft doing yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And and it seemed that they were getting a lot more kind of customers and it was it had more of that community feel. So I just think they might have lost direction a bit when it comes to regards of gaming. I think there's still money to be made, definitely, and retail spaces and places. But Well, I think you might be right in, in a way there because when I'm in, like, you know, I pop into game and stuff like that when I'm in town, um, and I like the experience of being in a shop and just, I mean, you know, you, you probably did the same when you were a teenager. You'd wander in, like, electronics boutique and yeah. just for a nose around, you might not buy anything, which I guess doesn't make the company's money if everyone just does that, but... I like the the experience of going into a shop. But whenever I'm in there, though, you don't see like kids hanging out in there and stuff like. No, you used no, to. there's not time to stop and chat. Like the the best thing that they had in the micro stuff store was one side, and it was just full of Minecraft, and all the kids yep. were on there, and that instantly gave it that feel of like you know when we were kids in the nineties and we were there, and there'd be a demonstration unit, and you'd be on Tony Hawk's for four hours <laughs> until they kick you out the shop, you know, yeah. and. It kind of just feels a bit like Asda at the moment. <laughs> it doesn't feel like... Yeah, you're right. You know, yeah. a, a, a shop. And guaranteed when you went into, like, our independent game shops, Playtime, probably every single time you were in there, you'd pick up a game, even if it was a, a smaller one. But I just go into game, look around and go, hmm. Yeah, same here. <laughs> you know, yeah. Leave like a bit, yeah. Same, same. I've seen it last week. Uh, but, I, yeah, I think they need to maybe bring the fun back somehow. I mean, you mentioned the Apple shop there, which is a good example. You walk in there... It's always packed there when everyone's on the iPads and the phones and yeah. messing them out with them. Well, you go to like Game Over Here, for example, you've maybe got an Xbox set up and a PlayStation 4, and that's it, like two in the whole shop. Yeah. And they're locked away in those glass cabinets, and they've got one game running on it. If you had kids in there, like on a weekend, having, you know, loads of game consoles all set up and everything. Well, I've fun. seen like attempted stars at the demo units, yeah. but they're never really attended and they're kind of broken. And there's like there's not like a hype man that like you used to have in the nineties. Like, <laughs> Come on, kids, have a go. Yeah, yeah. Sonic Two's on here. Wow. <laughs> yeah, you'd, you'd love it though. I I'd, I'd I, I remember and... the Virgin stores being yeah. like that. The Virgin stores, it was an experience. When I went, I was a kid. I'd go downstairs. They used to have this in Nottingham. I don't know if they had it everywhere else. They had this tube system. Right. So they'd have like an order, and then they put it in a little plastic tube, and then they put it in this pipe. And the pipe would suck the tube like a vacuum, like <laughs> a in pneumatic a, tube. Kind yeah, of yeah, and it would go vroom, all the way, and you could watch the tube go around the store, and then someone else would pick that up, and it would be like the game order, and it was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. You know, you, you're just buying games just to yeah, see yeah. it go through there. And Dad, then, give me your credit card again. Yeah, and then you had the cool vinyl people upstairs, yeah. and there was, and, and it was having that kind of fun experience, and it just feels a bit retaily. Yeah, you know, it's boring now, isn't it? Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, you know. I think the experience of walking into like, you know, and I find GameStop the same because it's pretty similar to Game in yeah. my experience from being in there. You walk I think in it was there, a bit better than Game, to be honest, actually. Yeah, but uh, not that much better. No, not, no it's not, tiny, not, not tiny keep, amount. Not yeah. enough to keep them going, obviously, yeah. by the looks of it. But it's no more exciting than buying a game off Steam, 
<laughs> really, yeah. yeah. It needs to be something else to get you in there and keep people in the shop. And But then I go to a retro show and I'll be like, I've got to buy this, whatever yeah. it is, and I'll come out with more stuff than I can carry, you know? So in the moment, it's like, you know, you can even buy, like, your, your grocery shopping on Amazon at the moment. It's like, we're all going to end up like, you know, those fat people on trolleys in Wally. It's going to be like that in the future, isn't yeah, it? There's no, nothing left on that. No, I, I, I like to <laughs> feel my vegetables before I purchase them. <laughs> Give that banana a good squeeze. Yeah. Right, now, before we get into our guest this week, uh, Frank Kaplaki, this is going to be such a good one. We did get a little comment, actually. Someone sent us this link on the retro gaming section of Reddit. Another little discussion point, actually. What do you think retro gaming will be like in 20 years? I guess that kind of follows on from my last little point there, in a way. Um, insofar as if everything goes digital, there's not going to be anything to collect, for example. Yeah, yeah. I, I think we don't know what it's going to be like in 20 years because... And I know you say everything goes digital and we'll lose it, but then there's great projects like archive.org and yeah. other other kind of things that, you know, before I would have thought, like, with the internet when it was so throwaway, like, everything going, I thought, oh, there wouldn't be anything. But I think there is the, the guys that are going to keep it alive, but it's like, is this going to be the period that changed everything? Was this the period, you know, the 8-bit to kind of the modern games... And was that the period that changed everything? Or is there going to be something insane coming up in a few years? And that's going to be the retro gaming that everyone in the future looks at. I don't know. I mean, we are kind of going into the unknown. I mean, what one thing I did notice in terms of, you know, had the Wii store shut down recently on the original yeah. Nintendo Wii. So anything you bought on there digitally is gone. You can't ever get it again. You can. Oh, okay. Watch modern vintage gamers' latest videos. Some, right. Someone's downloaded all of the whole of the Wii store. Okay. And you well, can you actually put it back onto your console and have, like, a, a copy of it, yeah. So, like you were saying a minute ago, like, archive.org, essentially. Yeah. It's down the community to archive these games and give you... A, well, that's reassuring, actually, Yeah, if that's the case. I mean, some people here are talking about, you know, people that were born, like, around the millennium, for example. Their retro is going to be, like, um, Xbox 360 and PS2 and that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, um, And they're talking here that one interesting point is whether consoles will be collectible... Because, I mean, you look at stuff like the PS2, Dreamcast and GameCube and the Xbox, for example, most of the library came out on all of those platforms. And now, pretty much all games are multi-plat. There's not that many, like, exclusives for certain systems these days. So it might make hardware collecting a bit less relevant. In the yeah, future. it's weird, because if you look at stuff like pinball machines and arcade machines, that's yeah. a specific one game, isn't it, for the machine? And that's what makes it valuable that you've got the Adams Family arcade or yeah. you've got this, but... If it's just a PlayStation that plays generic, yeah, I don't know. Who knows? Maybe there'll be a, a huge market for it. Maybe there'll be the antiques. There'll be like guys like Lovejoy in their shops. <laughs> like you know, that's your future. Yeah, isn't it? <laughs> perfect the dodgy accent. That's it. But see, I, I know, a, I know, a, like a, a kid. He's like, well, I call him a kid. He's like about twenty-two. My sister-in-law's boyfriend, and he's like I said, he's twenty-two. He's a young lad, and he actually is really into nineteen-sixties cars. Yeah, yeah. Before his time, and people in this thread are going, when we're like old and that, no one will care about stuff like the Mega Drive and the SNES. But I think, you know, younger people are coming into it all the time or are interested in looking through it. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like a loop. When you get older, you get into stuff like writing complaint letters to newspapers and stuff like this and you haven't collecting started that, old you? cars. Yeah. You haven't started that, Ravi, sure. No, not yet. <laughs> Penning to the Nottingham Post. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do read them for a laugh, though. There is actually a Facebook group called Angry People in Local Papers. Oh, Even yeah, yeah, yeah. We there. used to, our teacher used to go, if you want a bad example of poetry, our English teacher, he said, look in the local paper and read some of those poems. <laughs> <laughs> now, we will have more news on next week's podcast. It will be out on Friday, of course. Now, let's get serious about retro gaming. This one's going to be so interesting. We are joined by the legend that is Frank Kaplaki, video game composer for Westwood Studios, MTV, worked on games like Dune 2, Blade Runner, of course, Command and Conquer, Lion King. Let's get into this week's special guest. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast, and it is the bit we've been waiting for. Time to welcome on this week's amazing guest. Welcome to the show, Frank Kaplaki. Hello there. How are you? Good to be on. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, Frank. Now, uh, before we get into you know your time at Westwood Studios, games like Blade Runner, the CNC series, Star Wars. I mean, I was reading that your parents got you a drum kit when you were a kid to get you started. How did you convince them to buy you a drum kit then? <laughs> well, my parents were musicians too, so <laughs> uh, they were you know playing professionally around Las Vegas, you know where I grew up and still live, and. Um, 
so my dad played guitar, my mom played bass. They both sang. They, you know, and uh, they played uh, in a lot of different uh, Vegas casinos and whatnot and lounges, and um, and had different bands over the years. So I was always sort of around that environment because I would see their rehearsals all the time. You know, I would you know hear them working stuff out. You know, and and you know eventually they would try to show me things here and there. Uh, when I first uh, picked up, tried to pick up a guitar, you know. Being a small person, a small guy, you know, little guy, I just it wasn't it wasn't uh, grabbing me at the time because it was just really hard. Guitar is is probably one of the tougher instruments to learn how to play. So I was like, oh, I don't know about that, you know. So uh, so eventually, I said, you know, I want to I want to learn something, but what is it? What's what's going to be my thing? And I finally arrived at the idea of playing on drums because I thought in my mind as a kid. Oh yeah, you just gotta you know beat the crap out of those things, right? That's that's got to be easier than trying to play guitar. But <laughs> but um, you know my so my parents were like, okay, you know we'll we'll get you a drum set for Christmas, but um, under one condition, you have to take lessons once a week for an entire year. And if you decide after that that you don't want to continue, then that's fine. We can always sell the kit, but you know we want you to at least give it a fair shot. You know, actually learn how to play it, actually, you know, learn something about the instrument so that you can make an educated decision about whether or not you want to pursue it. So I appreciate that they did that because I, you know, did exactly that and took, took private lessons for a year. And, and, uh, I just had so much fun with it. Um, it made me want to play along to everything on the radio and, and develop my musical tastes and, and all of that. So it was, that was really a big part of it. I think there's something about being a been a young boy as well. I think, you know, the drums are like the holy grail of music, aren't they? Because I know when I was a kid, I really wanted to play the drums at school in music class, but everyone wanted to play the drums. So in the end, my teacher put me through a few other instruments first. I played the trombone for like three years. So I'm actually pretty good at the trombone now. <laughs> Never got onto the drums <laughs> <Nice>. though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, when you're when you're trying to take uh, band classes in, in school, you know, there is that where they try to place you, you know, in, in certain instruments because, you know, they're trying to uh, do where they, where they think the, the kids are going to best fit that class. But for me, I had the advantage immediately of already being a drummer. So when I'd go in and say, yeah, I'm already playing and I already have a kid at home and I already have, you know, lessons and already, you know, doing this. So, oh, okay, well, obviously we're going to have you on drums. That's a no brainer. So it was just, uh, and that came easy to me because I had such a head start at a young age, you know, through high school, all of that. It was just, a, that was just an easy A for me. <laughs> well, when you first started kind of programming basic and playing lots of other video games did you start to hear soundtracks or drumming in that that you'd kind of really get into yeah you know um it wasn't until that you know i i was exposed to you know the workings of of westwood studios and 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 took an interest in that that i kind of put that together in my mind of you know yeah i think i could do this uh, because before that it was um more about just wanting to be in a band and write original music with a band, go, you know, tour the world, sell a million albums, be famous, all of that fun stuff, you know, aspirations you have when you're a kid, you know, because that was kind of the thing, you know, I was really into, uh, really into music. I'd go to concerts all the time and I just said, you know, that's what I want to do someday, you know, and so that was kind of my early, you know, aspirations uh, once I got out of school. But um, as it turned out, uh, having the opportunity to grow with the video game industry because I started not only young, but started at a young point for the industry in itself, too. The very first game I worked on was on the original Nintendo Entertainment System. And that wasn't a far stretch from the Tandy 1000 in my mind because it's a three voice, you know, monophonic uh, polyphony thing. So it was the same thing. I'd, okay, I've got a bass line, I've got two melody lines, I can put in a little white noise drum behind it, and, and, uh, and then the sound effects would take up the other channels. So I, I immediately knew that I could jump into that and do something like that. And then Every single year, technology just would increase, and I would ke keep developing uh, as as we went. It was basically, I mean, being at Westwood was my college. You know, um, you didn't have classes for video game development back then. You know, you just had sort of general purpose education for you know, you know, yeah, there's music production or there's programming or there's this or there's that, but nothing specific to video game development. You really had to be into it and and just get get your hands dirty with with whatever tech was coming out, and and that was a really 
uh, expansive time with, you know, every year a new technology would come out that we would have to learn and adapt to and, and make the most out of. Well, you know that Tandy 1000 machine you just talked about then? I mean, I know that was kind of considered one of the best MS-DOS PCs of the era. Why did you want to get it then? And how did that machine eventually end up in your house? Well, back then, um, uh, I was, anytime I was exposed to people that had computers, I was uh, immediately taken with it. Um, you know, playing on friends, Apple twos and two E's and two C's and, and, uh, and, uh, Macintosh, you know, the early ones. And so, you know, I, I was, uh, enthralled with that. And then, uh, my parents had a friend who was also into computers and playing games. And so I, every time we went to their house, I would play on their, their system. And, and he actually had the, the Tandy 1000 and then he was going to upgrade to a, a better computer after a while. And so he offered to sell it to my parents for me. And, uh, so, you know, they got it at a good price. And so they said, okay, yeah. So they, they got it. And I started, uh, messing with it from there. Well, when you joined Westwood, you joined as a games tester. Um, was yep. that not as exciting as you kind of thought? Cause you moved later on into the audio department. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, as a teenager, the idea of getting paid to play video games sounds pretty damn awesome. Uh, <laughs> so I was like, yeah, yeah, that'd be great. So I went and did that and, you know, and once I kind of learned the ropes of what's really involved, then yeah, the, the luster of, of that initial thought kind of dwindled a bit because, you know, you realize that there is some work involved. You're not just playing the game and and getting paid for it you actually are trying to physically break the game at every turn so your 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 goal when you get into the office is not to just play through the game your your goal is to play it every single way you can think of that doesn't make any sense or that you know shouldn't be you shouldn't be allowed to do certain things you should try to do and and uh you know, just do, just do crazy stuff to, to try to break it. That's, that's your goal. You know, get, it's not to get through the level. It's to do everything in the level that is possible or not possible. And then report what your findings are. You know, you're supposed to, um, fill out a, a what we called a, a bug sheet, you know, or bug report. And you would, uh, write down the severity of the bug. Like, you know, is it, is it like a game breaker? Does it crash the game? You know, that's number one. And then like, number two would be, you know, well, it's, it's a, eyesore like it's an obvious glitch in the art or you know something that just stands out and then like down the, the tears from there would just be something minor like oh yeah you know the sound effect doesn't play when i do this or you know there's a there's a missing texture somewhere or things like that so you'd write down these reports and, and hand them in and then the programmers would fix it and then send it back to you and then you'd have to re- try to reproduce it again just to verify that it was fixed so it's a lot of back and forth and that way and that's kind of how testing works or quality assurance works and uh and then you just rinse and repeat you do the same exact thing the next day and and the next day and (laughs) and every time there's a new part of the game that's done and or you know needs testing then you go through that level or that mission or whatever the case may be so so yeah um you know i would get distracted you know and wander around and talk to people because i was just really interested in the process not because i didn't want to do the job it was just like okay well i know what this is about now and so on my break, I would go and talk to the artists or talk to designers or talk to, you know, the audio director and, and just ask questions about what they did and, and, you know, how it all worked. And just I was just very interested. So I mean, around that time, you mentioned like working on the NES and stuff like that. Do you think that was a really exciting time for like the emerging new technologies that were coming along? Because there was such big leaps in computing power and especially in audio as well. I imagine that really started to improve pretty rapidly. Oh yeah, absolutely. Like, like I was kind of touching on a little bit earlier. Um, yeah, starting from that, like the very next thing I worked on after that was, you know, um, you know, PC games and, and Genesis games. Um, so then that immediately jumped from, you know, a three voice, uh, monophonic FM synthesis to six voices. So I was like, okay, now I've got more to work with. Oh, now I can make instrument changes and program it a bit more. Nice. Do you remember using, uh, or hearing the first kind of sampling? And uh, oh yeah, yeah, doing that because uh, you did Lion King as well. Yeah, yeah, that yeah, we did that on the Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis. Um, and but on the Super Nintendo specifically, uh, we had to sample all of the instruments into that console because you know that's the way that that worked. And um, so that was a a pretty big challenge because you had very limited 
amount of space for, you know, for the samples themselves, you know, like we had to fit everything into like 11 K or something stupid like that. And, uh, so it was trying to, to get it crammed into such a small space, but still try to maintain a sense of quality. So, you know, I was experimenting with, you know, different uh, instruments that I could sample that would get the point across that I wanted, uh, efficiently and, you know, but not sound horribly artifacted. So it was just, that was a, a, a balance that, that we needed to achieve. Well, on the PC side of things around that time, I mean, obviously you had a bit more room to play with, I guess, on, on the PC, but also when stuff like AdLib came along, I mean, that must have been really good. I mean, did you have to kind of make different soundtracks for one game because of like AdLib and Sound Blaster and that kind of thing? Not really. So, um, yeah, AdLib, AdLib card was, was the first uh, PC card that I was using. Um, and that's, you know, I was using their, uh, their visual composer program along with their instrument maker program. So everything I did was, was centric to the ad lib card and the ad lib software, um, that translated perfectly over to the sound blaster cards because they basically all use the same FM synthesis chip. So did the Sega Genesis. So actually it was, um, you know, all, I, everything would would port over and, and sound pretty much identical. Um, in fact, we we had a converter program from uh, the PC MIDI files that we created with all of the uh, with all of the information of the instrumentation and whatnot that ported over to the Sega Genesis uh, Gems development development system. And again, it had the same chip in it, with the exception of the fact that it had sample playback on one channel. So I could actually use real drum samples instead of the FM synthesis drums. So I, I made that adjustment when we did like, say, you know, Dune for the Genesis versus the PC and whatnot. But, um, but I also utilized, uh, the Roland, uh, MT32 and, and sound canvas, um, MIDI modules as well. So that, you know, people who, you know, who are audiophiles that had, you know, higher end playback for music in a PC format would be able to take advantage of that too. So we, we clambered onto that pretty early on as well. It must have been a great getting MIDI support as well, because you could kind of hook up your real instruments and start playing with them. So that came a bit later, though, because um, when I first uh, was starting out, even on those kinds of, of cards and, and development systems, I was I was still very much in the box. I was kind of doing everything by hand and not really performing it uh, with a MIDI keyboard so much. Uh, it wasn't until we got into um, you know a bit more advanced technology, uh, I started using Cubase when it made the jump to the PC from the Atari ST. And... That became my main DAW, which I still use today. I've been a Cubase user for life ever since then. But um, <clears throat> but when I started using that, then it you know became apparent that I could take advantage of of using MIDI control much much more efficiently, you know, with a MIDI keyboard and using you know all of the hardware sounds that that we could start acquiring as we got uh, as we went towards uh, making the jump into uh, streaming music that would be played back via you know, 22K wave files, uh, the first of which was The Legend of Chimerandia 3 and then immediately followed by Command & Conquer. Well, when creating music for Dune 2, how much did you have to kind of reference the original? And being one of the first kind of RTS games, how important was that atmosphere? Um, so when we, got, uh, when we got to doing Dune 2, I was um, very much influenced musically by the of course the the original film that came out in the 80s uh the toto soundtrack and uh and the brian eno stuff and then also um the uh the other dune game that was being developed um by uh by creo um we were under Virgin at the time. We had just got bought by Virgin Interactive Entertainment, and they had uh, they were already doing another Dune game with Creo at the time. So that's why we called ours Dune Two, just because you know it was simultaneous development. But our, ours was going to come out a bit later, but it was going to be a different kind of a game too. So, in fact, it you know it's basically known as the first real time strategy game you know to to really hit. Um, so. Uh, so yeah, it was just one of those things where um, I took those musical influences, kind of hybridized them together, kind of made my own voice with it. Because they didn't really, they didn't really uh, tell me to, you know, stick to one thing specifically. They just, you know, I had I had a fair amount of creative freedom in those days to just kind of do whatever I felt um, as long as it fit. Um, so 
so that's really how that that came about. And um, I remember taking advantage of every uh, every MIDI thing I could do, you know, with the with the ad lib card and the instrument changes and tempo changes and and just I there were so many hand added. Uh, control changes into those scores. I mean, it just looked like a mess when you when you looked at it at a glance. It was just like, what is all of this stuff that's in here? But, but um, you know, that was just me taking advantage, full advantage of the the hardware that we had available. I mean, you mentioned about you know that being like an early RTS game, and the thing about it is, I mean, RTS games, unlike a lot of games at the time, were designed to be played for a very long time. I mean, we all had that friend who, like you know, you wouldn't see him for like four days because he'd been indoors playing Dune two, like you know, for an entire week. Um, <laughs> And yeah, all, totally. Yeah, well, well, the they mu- definitely were addictive. Well, the fact that you got this tr- music playing, I mean, how would you make sure that the tune would not get too repetitive and the music wouldn't drive people mad? Well, it's just a matter of having enough of a variety of the music in there that, you know, and 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 assign them to the different missions so that, you know, they would get mixed up and, and you'd have a variety of, of the different themes, whether you were just, you know, creating your base or getting into combat. Um, so... I think that the score was dynamic enough in the way that I composed it, along with the, the amount of variety that that we offered. That you know, it didn't get it didn't get old because there was enough there that you know could keep your ear interested. Even if you did recognize stuff after a while, or or start rem- memorizing stuff after a while, it, it wasn't like it was beating you over the head constantly like earlier games did. Well, one of our favorite games from that era, and we actually did a whole episode last year with Lewis Castle about Blade Runner, um, which I imagine must have been great fun working on that. But I mean, how did, how did you kind of approach recompiling the soundtrack for the game then? That must have been a big job. Yeah, that was a that was a dream project for me. Um, I really enjoyed it. It was I mean, it was for the whole studio, I would imagine. Uh, but, um, you know, it's one of my favorite movies of all time. And 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 the soundtrack, of course, was one of my favorites because it's so unique as it is. I mean, you know, Val- Vangelis is a genius. So um so the fact that I got to, uh, you know, dabble in that world was was a treat um, and a bit intimidating, to be honest, because what we had to do was um, we had the there's a weird thing with with music rights that happens sometimes where you get the rights to use one aspect of it, but not another. And that was the case for Blade Runner, where we had the rights to to the score, uh, the, the written music of the of the of the score, but not the recordings. So we couldn't utilize the recordings of the soundtrack to the movie, but we could recreate them if we wanted to. So, um, and of course I had nothing to go by. There was no sheet music for it really available or anything like that, you know, apart from maybe some lead sheets. So I basically recreated some of the signature themes from the film by ear from scratch sound by sound, note by note. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and that was a huge challenge because, you know, we're in the, the late nineties and I'm trying to recreate something that was done in the early to mid eighties. And, um, so I was basically taking the synthesizer hardware modules that I had at the time and making them sound retro, making them sound like the eighties, you know, counterparts of, of what Vangelis had used to the best of my ear and ability. And, uh, and that was a fun journey to take because, you know, it's like you're, you you kind of get to rediscover through his work, you know, what he was doing and how he put these things together and, and, the lush effects that was on everything and, and how it was performed. I mean, I think a lot of people don't realize that, you know, you didn't rely heavily on sequencers back in the eighties. You know, a lot of that was actually performed, you know, yeah. <laughs> it was recorded, you know, in, with a live feel and that's why it's so dynamic. And so, you know, organic in that sense. So even though it's synthesizer instruments, it has a very human feel to it. So I just did the best I could to recreate that, uh, to the best of my ability. And we did that with the main theme and, and the credits theme, the love theme, the Blade Runner blues. And, Man, that was a that was a task. I spent days just on one one of those tracks alone uh, to get to get to get it right, to get the mix right, the sounds right, the feel right. Uh, so I was really proud of that. And and the, and what was funny was a lot of people in the studio were commenting that they could notice how much more clarity was in the mix of, of the sounds because of you know we're using modern technology versus you know analog tape of the 80s and all of that so it was kind of funny <laughs> none of but, that background uh, hiss 
Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, and I got to add some some of my own original music to that as well. Um, albeit I'm certainly not going to say it was on par with anything Vangelis would have done because, you know, I'm no Vangelis. But, you know, as far as capturing the mood and the sound, you know, that's really what I was just trying to go for to complement that and uh, and add and add the right, you know, mood and, and setting to the game. Well, in the mid 90s, I mean, a lot of games kind of moved away from having kind of, well, you know, game data soundtracks to streaming music off CD-ROM. I mean, was that kind yes, of indeed. was that a big kind of benchmark moment? And was that kind of did you feel so free suddenly when that came in? Kind of. Yeah. I mean, it was well, it was definitely was a big moment because now there was emphasis to make that as good as we could. And so now it wasn't really about me utilizing um, the hardware since as a means of coming up with ideas that would then get translated to MIDI. It was about actually utilizing the sounds at hand as the final thing. And so that opened up that world and then, you know, definitely made us, you know, start getting different kinds of gear that would, you know, uh, be, be of professional bar quality. And, and so, uh, yeah, when we got into that, it was definitely, uh, freeing in the sense that now I can make things sound any, any way that I want. I don't have to be limited to, not only uh, uh, the limitations of, of MIDI playback on certain systems or consoles, but I'm not limited to the type of sound that I'm using, even the, or the or the instrument palettes. You know, I can I can sample anything. I can bring up any instrument I want. So that that part was cool, and and so I just experimented from there. And you know, obviously, you know, you you have a guideline of of what kind of style that you're going to do per game. Game and and you set that you know with with the team and 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 uh, and then you move forward from there so so then it's very focused in terms of you know genre and, and instrumentation and and the kinds of you know things that I'm doing from that perspective um, but it was an exciting time for sure because um, you know it was it was great to finally get away from limitations of of MIDI playback systems. Well, when creating Command and Conquer, it was going to be that huge multimedia experience so i was wondering how you approach the soundtrack did you do it like say a film score or something like this or did you come up with something completely new a, a kind of rts idea of sound well um command and conquer because it was the first of of the series um and uh you know we were basically just doing something brand new with the 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 sort of uh, direction we'd set already with Dune 2. But now we had, you know, uh, a much you know, larger uh, uh, format to play with, with CD-ROM. So, um, you know, everybody was just so creative on that project and super into it and, and you know, really put in a lot of, of effort, extra effort between doing the cinematics and us doing, you know, the, the audio, you know, that would be streamed and, you know, and, and having this just immersive gaming experience overall. I mean, right from the installation, you know, you're already in, uh, you know, so everything about it was very creative and very, you know, forward thinking. And, and, uh, when it came to the music part of it, you know, a lot of that was, was a hundred percent experimentation. We didn't know what the game necessarily needed to be per se in terms of, of a music style. So we decided to just go for a lot of different styles, um, and mix elements of things together. You know, we had a, a meeting, uh, a kickoff meeting sort of in, in, uh, Paul Mudra, our audio director's office with Brett Sperry, the president of Westwood and, and, and the visionary, one of the visionaries behind CNC. And, we basically sat there and, and talked about, you know, what should the music be for this game? And and we started just playing a bunch of CDs for each other in this room, just kicking around ideas like, hey, what about, you know, a piece of this song, like this particular part? What do you think of that? Or what do you think about the genre of, of this band or this artist? What do you think about this one song from this one movie? You know, we just kind of listened to a bunch of different things and, and, um, and put it all together. And uh, I took all of those elements and ideas and i put them on a cassette tape <laughs> and uh and you know brought some ideas to the table as well and they just said you know just try it all try everything don't be limited don't feel like you have to stick to exactly what we said just just take these ideas and and our discussion and run with it and do whatever you feel like and we'll try everything you know so that's what i did literally 
Uh, I started writing, you know, everything from techno to metal to hip hop to orchestral to everything, everything under the sun and then started fusing some of these styles together even. And, and that, that really just became what Command and Conquer's soundtrack was. Um, you know, I didn't necessarily expect that a lot of it would work or that it would, you know, all get utilized, but it really, it ended up being that way. And, and that just kind of added to the charm and the personality of the game. I know we hear stuff like, you know, Nine Inch Nails and Ministry and stuff in there as well. I mean, were, were, they kind oh, of, yeah. were they really open to this kind of industrial soundtrack kind of idea as well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was, you know, Nine Inch Nails has always been a huge influence for me. And and you mentioned Ministry too. I definitely had listened to some of that stuff back then as well. Um, you know, but it was uh, it was all over the board. I mean, like I said, there were so many influences being drawn up. I mean... You know, b- b- besides those bands, you know, like I was into Rage Against the Machine, um, Vince DiCola, who did the Rocky IV and Transformers animated film in the 80s. Uh, he's one of my you know, all time favorites. So I, I brought some of that in. I, you know, Pink Floyd, uh, you know, t- soundtracks to like Apocalypse Now and Top Gun and, you know, stuff like that. You know, I was just it was just a, a wide variety of stuff. Dr. Dre, I was listening to that, too. <laughs> so. so uh, you throw all that stuff together and, and uh, you know, I just kind of kind of made a soundtrack of it. <laughs> well, there was kind of different paces for different stages and levels and stuff. And, you know, some of the harder ones, it would get a bit more industrial. And it would get a bit more techno-y on one. Um, was this kind of something you did deliberately? Uh, not necessarily. So I had composed a wide variety of music and... Basically, our audio director, uh, Paul, he he was uh, in charge of really kind of selecting where these songs were going to be played and, and what missions they felt the best in. There were certain key themes that I'd written for, with specific reasons in mind, like like the song No Mercy was definitely a nod slash Kane theme. Like I used that melody for Kane in, in all the subsequent sequels. Um, and uh, and then also like... Um, there's a melody in the the song airstrike that's kind of more in association with the gdi but um but you know there was some of the harder themes i would anticipate would be you know more intense combat or or more villain associated and some of the more uh you know groove oriented uh themes you know were uh i think more like in the gdi realm so but but again you know a lot of that was decided a bit later you know, after I'd already composed a lot of different music. So it was just a matter of, you know, just kind of finding where things fit the best. And that's kind of a a real standard now in modern games, that you'll go into an area and you'll hear a piece of atmospheric music and it will mean that something's going to happen or it will work and build up the tension. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, there's there's so many methods of implementation now. I mean, there's so many different techniques depending on how you want that to affect, you know, the player and the gameplay. So, you know, uh, back then we were really just selecting full themes to play during, you know, a level or during, you know, either the start of the mission or, or during the combat. It wasn't uh, as involved beyond that. But we did have a jukebox mode for for people to utilize, uh, especially with regard to multiplayer. We wanted people to be able to choose their own battle music when they were going into multiplayer and, and have fun with that, and, and people loved that op- that option. Well, moving on to Red Alert 2, did you think that the uh, mighty Hell March would resonate with so many people? Oh, I had no clue. I really didn't. Um, the story behind that is... Uh, you know, I didn't really know what Red Alert was going to be about. I all I knew was that we were going to do another CNC game, so I assumed it was going to be a sequel to the one we'd already done. Um, I'd started working on some more music ideas, and and I just had like a, a one of those moments where you know everything just like aligned perfectly for me. One day, I woke up. As soon as I woke up in the morning, I knew immediately I want to write a, a heavy song to the sound of marching boots. That was the first thing I thought of when I just woke up one morning on my way to work. So I get in my car and I go to work. And the first thing I do is I look for a sample of of marching boots and I find it. And so I'm like, all right, cool. And then I picked up the guitar and the very first riff I played was the main riff of Hell March. It just came right out. So I was. It's like, all right, this sounds cool. And I ran with that and I finished the whole song that same day. Like it was just like from from be- from the beginning of my day to the end of the day, complete song done, just flowed naturally, no problem. Then I thought this would be kind of a cool badass tune for Nod or something like that, you know, for the next CNC. 
So after I'd finished it, um, Brett, uh, Brett Sperry came by my office and he said, Hey, I, I heard you got, you know, a new tune for the, for the next game that you kind of worked on. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, check it out. So he listened to it and he's like, wow. He's like, this needs to be the main theme for the, for the next CNC. And I'm like, Oh, sweet. <laughs> he's like, but it's not a nod theme. He's like, he's like, it's going to be, uh, we're going to go back in time and do this whole, like, you know, alternate history thing. And I'm like, Oh, okay. Well, whatever works. <laughs> that is like, iconic. Now, I mean, it's even like an internet meme, isn't it? It's like, it's yeah, huge. yeah, it is. <laughs> it's and really the, taken on a viral life of its own over the years. And there's been an aversion in every single Red Alert as well, hasn't there? There's like Hell March 3 and Hell March 2. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. yeah, we did yeah. Hell March 2, Hell March 3. It, it's, it's definitely like the signature theme for the Red Alert part of the Command & Conquer series. So, um, so I tried to kind of reinvent the song in a, in a new way every time there's been a new game. Um, so, you know, Hellmarch 2 definitely had a very different feel to it from the first, but still utilizes the same familiar riff. I just kind of, you know, uh, altered the tempo and the and the, the feel of it so that it, instead of a triplet feel, it's a straight rock and feel. And and um, I actually, uh, when I worked on Hellmarch 3 for Red Alert 3 and I came back for that, um, and, you know, of course, at the time I was brought back as one of, you know, several composers. I didn't work on the whole game. I, they just wanted me for the main themes. But um, so I originally had intended to reinvent the song again with a whole different feel. But um, the audio director there felt that they really wanted to kind of keep it more similar to Hell March 2 and just kind of spice it up a bit with an orchestra and and. And, uh, you know, maybe just alter it a little bit, but not too much. And I was like, oh, well, OK. <laughs> so uh, so so I did that, you know, and I thought, you know, the symphonic element would be kind of fun. So at least that was a new spin to put on it. And uh, and we recorded it over at Skywalker Sound with the symphony there. And that was pretty badass. So uh, yeah. but yeah, uh, doing those games was really, really cool. And, and Red Alert, the first Red Alert particularly felt like the game that I really honed in on my own style a bit more than i had before that you know where i was kind of always in experimentation mode red alert felt like okay now i have more of a solid style now now there's more of a a, a consistent voice with this well frank you know you've obviously become like the sound of cnc and like we were overjoyed last year and we heard the news um about the video of the remastering of cnc i mean kind of how did that kind of all come together then and um when did you like first hear about the ideas and how did you get involved again so this is really an ironic kind of thing because um, I, I say the planets must have aligned for Command and Conquer this year somehow because there's just so much that's gone that's popped up not related to each other that that are all about that. So it starts off uh, a year ago, uh, a little over a year ago, last January, um, where I had finally made the decision that I was going to put together a live show of doing the best of command and conquer music. And I was going to do it at Magfest, which was, um, you know, a music and game festival that's, you know, been annual for several years and, and just kept, you know, building in its audience. And, uh, so, so I, I'd started planning that already in the beginning of the year, then, uh, halfway through the year around summer, um, EA contacted Petroglyph and myself about, uh, you know, the idea of doing remasters, um, they felt that, you know, with, uh, they really wanted to, to do it right with, with the original development team, you know, if it was possible. So that's why they reached out to us. The fans have obviously been asking for, for that, for EA to utilize us in some capacity with a CNC game, you know? And so, so they, they made the move and, and, uh, met with us and it went really well. And so that's really what kind of got that started. Um, and you know, that was, and it was, I was really flattered to hear that, you know, a big part of, you know, the, uh, the idea of doing that. Cause, um, Jim Vasella, the, uh, EA uh, producer who's, who's working with us on this, he actually put out a Reddit post before he even announced that, you know, that we were going to do this. He said, Hey, we're thinking about doing the remasters. You know, what, what does the community think about this? And apparently a bunch of them chimed in and said, you got to get Frank Klepacki back. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that was a really flattering. So, um, so yeah, that was kind of a given that I was going to, you know, be doing that along with, you know, Petroglyphs and, you know, I work with them. And, um, so that aligned and, and, uh, we got on board and, and we're working on it now. Um, and then 
in addition to that, uh, Lewis Castle is doing a uh, game developers conference post-mortem on the original Command & Conquer this coming March, and I'm helping him out with that, putting that presentation together as well, which is which is also not related. He had no idea that we were you know, signing on to do remasters at the time he started putting that together. So it was just like, okay, this must be the year for Command & Conquer to make a comeback. <laughs> well, how's kind of it going with the, with the remastering then? Is things progressing well? Yeah, so far, um, you know, it's still very early in the stages of that. So there's not really a lot I can say about it at this point, other than, you know, we're just really deep in assessing everything uh, about the original, uh, you know, source code and how it all works and, and how we're going to appropriate that with, with our modern technology so that, you know, the gameplay is, is going to feel exactly as it did, but obviously be uh, reworked to, you know, operate on modern OS and, and take advantage of higher resolutions and things like that. So, um, and obviously that's going to, you know, in my involvement, you know, being audio director on that, I'm going to make sure that, you know, as much of the audio assets, you know, are going to be higher quality as, as possible. And then, and then we'll take it from there. So that's kind of where we're at. Well, you mentioned Petroglyph Games there and, uh, you created the Star Wars Empire soundtracks. This must've been a uh, really good fun for you because you're a big Star Wars fan. Oh, it was the best, best, best years, best years right there, man, uh, for me. Um, cause you know, that was, that was my ultimate dream project of all time. Um, when we got to work on star Wars empire at war, you know, and that was right when petroglyph started, you know, cause Westwood, you know, had been consolidated by electronic arts and, uh, I spent about a year and a half, uh, just freelancing. Um, and, uh, and I knew the guys at, uh, petroglyph were, were forming their, their studio and, and, you know, looking for their, their first projects. And that just happened to be the first one they landed. So they knew immediately, you know, Hey, we want to get you on board for this. We know you're a huge Star Wars fan. And I'm like, Oh, absolutely. Are you kidding? I'm going to sink my teeth into this. Like you wouldn't believe. And, um, that was just, yeah, it was, it was a dream project for me because I got to, you know, audio direct and, and create assets for a world that not only was I familiar with as the back of my hand, but, but, you know, to be really super excited and, and proud that, you know, I, I'm, I've arrived to that point, um, you know, getting to go visit Skywalker ranch and George Lucas's property and, and, you know, the work facilities and his, his home and all of that stuff. I mean, it's, it's just surreal. And, uh, and in having, you know, the, the original movie sound assets, you know, to play with and put into the game, you know, and going, you know, every, everything I clicked on, I just had a big smile on my face like, oh, there's the Chewbacca sounds. Oh, there's the lightsaber sounds. Oh, that's so cool. So I was just like a kid in a candy store. And then, of course, musically, of um, you know, a huge fan of John Williams goes without saying it's probably the first like real uh, impactful musical experience I can remember as a young kid because when you think about it when star wars first came out the first movie uh you know i was like three four years old uh so I, it was actually i think i was four when i saw it the first time because it was on video i saw it on video for the first time and as we all know the very first thing that happens is you see the star wars logo flash on the screen and all you and then all that's happening is scrolling text now if you think about that visually that's not very exciting <laughs> okay but John Williams score that opening fanfare just hooks you immediately. It lets you know that something awesome is about to happen. And right from that moment, I knew I was in. So that stuck with me all these years. I've always been a Williams fan. So the fact that I got to contribute original music alongside of, you know, his obviously iconic score in these games was, was a treat for me. But as a fan, I also wanted to respect the property and and the story as much as possible because i know it so well i'm like okay if from a fan's perspective i'm not gonna i'm not gonna try to insert myself you know in in every part of this game you know i want to do this justice i want to do this right i want to do this the way it, it, it needs to be from the from everybody else's perspective and from that from that idea i wrote themes that were placed in areas of the game that were not related to the films I thought that was the best decision to make. The best decision was to blend in, not stand out. So, you know, when we went to other worlds or other generic space battles or, or anything like that, that's where I would take advantage of putting new music that I created. Everything else was Williams appropriate, 
where it's supposed to be, what moments it's supposed to be for. I made sure all of that lined up. And, you know, I definitely uh, accomplished that, I felt. And, and and from the fans' perspective, too, they, they felt the same way. They're like, yeah, this 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 really hits the head on, on the original trilogy feel of, of Star Wars. And, uh, you know, doesn't there's nothing that that stood out that seemed like it would be awkward so that was uh that was really what i set out to do and uh loved every minute of it and i think with you know something like star wars because it's such an iconic and beloved franchise as well it really helped that you're a fan because it's the kind of thing you, you can't get that wrong can you you never want to get that wrong yeah exactly and, and even the uh producer uh at uh, lucas lucas arts at the time uh, we were working with uh, brett toasty he was like he's like it's it's really good that your audio director is a huge star wars fan yeah. <laughs> he's like that's a plus <laughs> <laughs> Well, also you did some um, music for MTV for advertising as well. I mean, that must have been a little bit different and, you know, different audience. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, the commercials were, were fun. Um, and, it, you know, what was funny was um, before we got the final um, voice actors in the game, uh, I had stubbed in a bunch of stuff um, where I was basically impersonating a lot of the characters. <laughs> and um, and so in the commercial, we hadn't gotten the uh, the final Vader yet. So my voice is actually in the commercial is Darth Vader. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Amazing. You can, so you can, you can put that on your, on your IMDb then, can't you, that you played Darth Vader, I guess? <laughs> yeah, yeah, for a minute. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but that was actually part of an even funnier story, which was that when we were working on the first playable level as a, a milestone deliverable, for LucasArts, um, the audio director at, at, at LucasArts uh, didn't get the memo that this was our first delivery of the game. He thought that this was considered a final delivery of the game. So he was listening to everything and going, oh, man, he's like, we, we really got to get you more of the right sounds and, and half of the voices don't sound right. And I'm like, half? <laughs> <laughs> I had to laugh about that because I was all of them. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's quite the compliment, actually, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was like, I'll take that as a compliment, no problem. So, you know, once we explained to him you know, what the real situation was, he, he laughed about it. And so it was, it was all funny. But Well, we hear a lot about kind of video games live now. And we've just heard about the Tomb Raider anniversary where they've been doing all the Tomb Raider music live. But I remember back in the day seeing a video of you with a huge red robe and a really funky guitar performing Command & Conquer Live. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was guest appearing with uh, Video Games Live uh, doing the Hell March uh, themes uh, with them at, at on various dates here and there, which whatever ones I could I could make, you know, that, uh, that worked out with my schedule. And uh, yeah, so the very first time I did it, yeah, I dressed up as a conscript from Red Alert and, uh, and uh, you know, used my uh, signature guitar, which, yeah, you're, as you described, is, is pretty funky looking. Um and uh, yeah, and but I mean, it doesn't just look crazy. I mean, it actually sounds really good. I, I use it on everything I recorded on ever since I've I've had it made. So, uh, so I'm, yeah, I, I really I really enjoy playing it. But uh, but it just also happens to be a, a fun showpiece as well. I mean, you do like Magfest with um, Frank Kaplecki and the Tiberian Suns, which is an awesome name. I mean, will you ever do, like, do a world tour and like, will you come to Europe, Gamescom, that kind of thing? Oh, yeah, I would love to. Uh, in fact, uh, I did get some interest from uh, a European agency up there. So uh, so we'll see if they can uh, put something together. Maybe we'll maybe we will make our way up there. <laughs> oh, we've got to make it along to that. We'll have to keep an eye out. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I definitely would like to do more shows with that. Um, you know, that the that big uh, Magfest kickoff was was so successful i mean we packed a ballroom full of five thousand people and uh you know we had just a great stage production everybody there was super awesome to work with the whole crew um you know and of course uh you know the band uh the tiberian sons that, that played with me i i hired them i mean i asked them to join forces with me i don't want to say hired them i just i asked them to join me for that uh specific show because first of all they were the ones that told me about it to begin with a few years back because they had performed uh, at it before themselves doing their own kind of crazy uh, video game arrangements that are really awesome. And uh, Hellmarch happens to be one of the ones that they did. So, um, so yeah, uh, I, I was talking with uh, Tony Dickinson, who's like their band leader and, and uh, we'd been in touch for several years and, you know, and I, I mentioned it on, on the, at the show live, you know, to the audience that, you know, you know, he was, basically responsible for uh, telling me about it in the first place so it only made sense knowing how good that band is that i was like you know what you guys should join me for this you know let's let's do this together 
And, uh, and then our awesome visuals guy, uh, Nate Horsfall came on board and just put together a great video wall for us, uh, with all of the, the visuals that he, that he put together for all of the songs. And, and then of course, you know, the stage production at MAGFest was over the top this year They you know, they brought in lasers, they brought all kinds of stuff. So look, it looked amazing. So the value that we got for that show was, was pretty incredible. And, uh, and, and the quality of it was, was as best as I could have expected. And, and it went really well. So I'm very happy with that. And as a result of that, yeah, uh, we have a show that's ready to go for anybody else that wants to book us. So, <laughs> well, I think it's awesome seeing video games music being done live as well. And I imagine, you know, in terms of getting the, the respect that the genre deserves as well, I mean, people seeing it live, I guess is that something you've kind of noticed over time that video game soundtracks have been taken like as seriously as movie soundtracks now? I mean, that there weren't maybe previously? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, and I, I started kind of getting the hint of that even years ago. You know, it took me a while to, to arrive at that. But because um, I, I tend to be very focused in my own bubble, you know, like I'm just working on stuff that I love to do and I'm on to the next project. And I don't really, you know, think too much about, you know, uh, uh, the, the wider audience that's out there, even though I know I'm aware of it. And, and I know it exists, but it still just blows my mind when I actually get a chance to interact with fans, whether it's at conventions or or at a show like Video Games Live or or the one I just did at Magfest, and and they just you know come out in droves, and I'm just like, man, I was like, this is this is really incredible and, and special that you know there's like a, a dedicated audience just for this, just for video game music, you know, and and uh, it blows my mind still. I mean, and and I, I love it, you know. I, I think it's it's kind of like. To me, it almost feels kind of like the new rock and roll, uh, not literally in the aspect of rock music, but literally and uh, figuratively in the aspect of that it's it's a, a special thing that you know is is kind of niche, but more but more wide than than even that. And um, because video games is is the other entertainment medium that's in the mainstream for everybody you know you you can't discount it as as a smaller thing uh you know it's it's there's music there's movies there's video games you know television shows and and it's it's all on par it's all high quality it's all creative and and people take those memories that they have of playing these games and and it means so much to them as much as any other experience that that people have so so uh that's that's pretty amazing I know it's it's incredible. You've been the soundtrack to you know so many people's lives and experiences too. That that must be really special. It is. It really is. I mean, especially when I hear a lot more personal stories from people that that when they share with me about uh, you know what was going on in their life at the time. You know, some people you know had had re, reunited with their family over video games that they played, whether it was Command and Conquer or whatever. And you know, some people say you know it's like just the best times of their lives with their friends and having land parties or. Or, uh, or that it got them through tough times that they were going through personally, whether it was battling illness or whatever, you know. And so, you know, you, you hear that stuff and, and you realize that, you know, it's not just impactful as uh, entertainment. It's impactful in that the entertainment provided something much more personal for these people. And, uh, and so to be part of that, you know, that soundtrack to, to what they, you know, have as, as a, a, a fond memory is great. You know, it's, it's a really, really endearing. Well, Frank, long may it continue. I mean, you know, we can't wait to see the CNC remaster as well. That's something we're really excited about. And if people want to keep, kind of keep up to date with what you're up to, I mean, do you have a website or do you tweet or anything like that? People can check it out. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, you can go to my website, uh, which is just my name, frankklepacki.com. Or uh, I am also, uh, I have uh, you know, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, official pages. So you'll, you can find those pretty easily. Um, and, uh, yeah, so... Uh, most of my goings on are, are, are up there. Frank's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me, guys. Have a good one. <laughs> <laughs>